in this video I am going to share my thoughts on this tome, The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. This book is huge. You can see that I do not own this book. I borrowed this book from the library. Um, actually, I can't say I don't own the book. <laughs> this actually goes into my funny story about it. Um, I actually own this book on audio. I purchased it from Audible with one of my Audible credits um, quite a while ago, and I put off reading it because it was so long. <laughs> it's, it's such a huge book. So it was so long, so I kind of put it on the back burner because I had a, a lot of other um, audiobooks and other books that I wanted to get to, and it was so long that it was intimidating. And I was like, I'll, I'll get to it when I have time to devote to the book. Um, and then the world went crazy, and I was able to really catch up on a lot of my audiobooks. Um, so I think I went from, you know, having like, 60 books in my audible queue to uh, really getting through it. <laughs> um, and one of the last ones that I had on there was The Priory of the Orange Tree, and I was like, okay, I can finally get to this book and devote the time that it needs. So I started listening to the audiobook, and I was not necessarily getting confused, although I will say that it, it hops areas and narrators quite frequently and if I'm being completely honest of why I picked up the book book there was a character that when I'm listening to the audio I kept having to like just pause like I would get stuck um, because every time I would hear the name like it just was sounded like Lord Satan and so I had to see what that name was, and it technically is Lord Satan, um, but it's S-E-Y-T-O-N. <laughs> so yeah, I had to grab the book so that I could see like the spelling of the actual character names. Um, and it does help to keep up with the book and the characters and what's happening. So sometimes if a book is very long and in-depth, I like to have both uh, mediums so that I can listen and read and it just it's more immersive that way for me um, maybe not for you maybe you're fine either just with audio because you're an audio um, learner and absorber or maybe you just have to have the book because you don't like audio and either one of those is fine but sometimes I find if it's massive, I do better having both book and audio because I can totally immerse myself in that world. And so I did do that at times here. At times I could just listen to the audio and it was fine. Um, but sometimes I just had to go back and make sure that I was catching all of the pieces. And it's, it's very easy to do that because you'll have the chapter listings and so you just have to find it in the chapter. So once again, this is a tome. I mean, you can see how big this book is. Um, it's 800 pages. Fairly medium print though, so it's not like tiny print in 800 pages. It's it's just a good size. I'm also going to say right off the bat that the first half of the book, good half, maybe a little bit more than half, was very slow going for me. Um, I think actually that's the case for a lot of people. There's just a lot of world building and setup in that first half of the book um, that you s almost start to feel like, okay, I'm done with this, it's boring. Um, but the second half really picks up steam. Like, it, it suddenly is like, okay, now we're going to get to the end. Like, uh, suddenly characters who have been narrating throughout the whole thing will be meeting, they'll be sharing the information that they learned, and uh, so hidden motives and secrets are revealed, and then the movement of the book quickly picks up the pace and, you know, leads you towards the big epic ending. Um, so if you find yourself struggling with the first half of the book, just know that that is pretty common. Um, but it's well worth it to stick with it and get to the end. Um, I do think this was a satisfying read. Like, I got invested in some of those characters and what they were doing. Um, and so that being said, I will get into the main structure of the book. So the narrative does pretty much flip-flop um, from 
the eastern to the western <laughs> characters. Um, you will get a little bit of the south later. Uh, but essentially, one of the main parts when we're opening, the eastern look really follows the character Tane. And Tane is a young orphan who, right at the beginning, she has been accepted into the um, High Sea Guard. So they take the students and they divide them. I think one is more scholarly and the other is the High Sea Guard. And the High Sea Guard actually gets to work with dragons. Uh, sea dragons, not air and fire dragons. I'll tell you more about those fire dragons later. So the, the sea dragons just help defend the eastern realm slash land. And so that's that part of the narrative really just follows Tane and what's happening with her and the dragon and the people that she knows. So the western narration mostly follows the character of Eid, and she is serving as an ordinary chamberer to uh, Queen Sabran, or Sabran the Ninth of Innis. And Sabran is the leader of the Western realm. And it's interesting with Sabran. Uh, you do get to see a lot of Sabran, even though she's not the main narrator. Sabran is kind of spoiled, but at the same time, you almost feel bad for her because. Yes, she's spoiled, but she has all of this, um, all these people pressuring her because she needs to get married and she needs to have a daughter. And they need her to do that so that it can guarantee that the threat of the Nameless One is held at bay because they believe that if Sabran does not have a daughter, the Nameless One will rise again. There's not too much I can say about the Nameless One other than the threat of the Nameless One is constantly in the background. Um, and I would consider the Nameless One the big bad of the piece, the, the whole book. Um, but you don't necessarily see too much. A lot of, especially the first half, is more political intrigue and just, like I said before, um, world building, character development, layout. Um, so there are other narrators besides Iad and Tane, um, one of which is Lord Artaloth or Loth. Um, Loth is a friend of Sabran, and <laughs> Loth gets sent away by Lord Satan, uh, <laughs> which is where I kept getting caught on that name, uh, fairly early on in the book, and he is sent away because they believe that his relationship with Sabran is too close, and so they don't want any gossip around those two, so he's sent on some journey, and he has to go, and so we will at times follow uh, Loth on his journey and what's happening there. And he is actually a key component too. So some of the, the information and everything that he's doing will come back at the end of the narrative. Um, another character narrator is Nicolaes. And Nicolaes is an older character. Um, I think he's supposed to be around 64 or 65 at the beginning of this narration. And He's had an interesting past, which I won't get too into, but essentially um, Nicolaes is an alchemist and, and an anatomist, and he is searching for the secret to eternal life. So, you know, think of a lot of other alchemists, um, including Nicholas Flamel, and the whole quest for the uh, Philosopher's Stone and eternal life. That's essentially Nicolaes' role in this, um, but he also comes to some other discoveries and things happen um, in his journey. I'm trying to think if we have other narrators. They're, they're the main four, I would say. You're, you're going to see a lot of Loth, Nicolaes, Aid, and uh, Tane. Aid. I just said her name wrong. Sorry. <laughs> You'll see a lot of Aid. And uh, I would say actually Aid is the main narrator of the whole book. You'll hop back to her a lot more frequently than the other ones, and I think that's because she's so close to Sabran. So in the initial setup in the plot development, um, there's a lot kind of going against Sabran. Um, so not only does she have that force that's trying to get her to get married and have a baby, a daughter I should say, they don't want just a, a baby, it has to be the daughter, the next queen that's going to take over Ennis. Um, beyond that, there are shady political dealings that are trying to get rid of Sabran. 
Uh, so she gets a lot of uh, death threats and risky things happening around her, and you do kind of feel for her. <laughs> it is not easy. Um, so you will see that, and um, I don't know, there's, I don't want to reveal too much. Um, there is more to Eid than her just being this chamberer. Um, and you will see her development and who she actually is revealed. And especially as more of the plots against Sabran come out, then also more of Eid and her actual purpose is revealed. And it's all very intriguing. Now, another representation that is always present, but not necessarily present, um, is the South, and to the South is the Priory. And yes, this Priory, the Priory of the Orange Tree. Um, and it's really fascinating because in this world, there is this overarching um, mythology and uh, cosmology of the land. So uh, I think it's really interesting when you start to meet these other characters and as they interact, you start to see um, people believe that other areas have heretical beliefs. Um, but are they heretical? Um, you have to stick with the whole story to get how everything works together at the end. Um, and I, I just thought that was fascinating because you only get pieces here and there. It'll be, um, you know, to the, the West, they have their belief about how their land was formed and who their heroes are. But the Priory holds this other belief um, and then, of course, the East has theirs. And I think the North is actually where the uh, Nameless One is based. So we don't see too much of the North other than the kind of threat from the North. Um, but it's it's very interesting. And a lot of that whole cosmology also ties back into the Nameless One and what's happening there. And uh, as I said earlier with the dragons, the dragons of fire, um, as opposed to those water dragons that are working with the East, they are from the Nameless One, so they're actually part of the threat that's happening. So people do not like those other dragons. Um, every, well, everybody outside of the East kind of has a negative feelings about dragons in general, but like at least the East respects the water dragons. They only fear the dragons from the Nameless One. Um, but it's all very interesting. I love how the stories um, interwove and came to a completion. Um, I will say just an added thing. So there is kind of, kind of magic. It's not an overwhelming magic system, but the, the magic comes more from the Priory and their belief system, as opposed to the two other realms to the West and East. And I thought that was fascinating too. Um, I don't know. I, I do like how everything came together. So, again, even though I struggled with that first part of the book because it is so overwhelming and there's so much world building and so many characters, there are so many characters, um, still, when it, when it came together, when you see those little threads in the narration finally start to be woven together to create that final piece at the end, it is so satisfying and it's so good. Um, because I was worried about that. I'm like, where is this going? I'm starting to lose my interest and get bored. But then suddenly when the characters are meeting or reuniting and they're sharing that information and you just see those threads getting woven tighter and tighter together, you're like, oh my goodness, this is really good. <laughs> um, so I would say it's, it's definitely well worth it. If you're struggling with that first half. And I know that seems like a lot because it's like 400 pages. Just know that all of that information and world building does have a point and it, it does get satisfying at the end. Um, and by end, I mean final half. I mean, I, I don't just mean the, the very end of the book, which is also satisfying, but I mean that whole final half is very satisfying as you see it coming together. Um, so stick with it. Don't Don't give up on it. It's so well worth it. Uh, I will say, like, having completed the book, I am interested in going back and reading Samantha Shannon's other series, The Bone Season, um, because I've read that, 
for a lot of people they enjoyed that more. So I would be kind of interested in seeing what that series is like. Um, I of course love fantasy so I'm always willing to try out most fantasy series at least. Um, and more often than not I end up completing them. But you know having enjoyed that last half of this book I would be interested to see like how she does on the narrative of the bone season. So I think that this book is great for fantasy readers. It's definitely if you are more into fantasy you'll, you'll probably find it more accessible than you know if you just want to try fantasy maybe don't start with this book. <laughs> There's a lot of great uh, introductory fantasy books that I would consider starting with but if you are used to reading fantasy then you probably enjoy this book. Um, I, I also just liked it because of the cosmology that was built for the book. So maybe if you also like, you know, the creation stories and myths and world building, maybe you could start with this book. If you like a lot of characters and political intrigue, this book covers that too. I think who I mean um there is light romance in this book but it's not a romance heavy book at all by any means um so I I think if like that doesn't appeal to you don't worry there's even though there's light romance it's not anything that's not the main story that's here so anyway you don't have to worry about that if you're not too into romance it's not a it's not a romancy fantasy it is it's just a solid <laughs> fantasy. Um, yeah, I quite enjoyed it. I would definitely recommend it to fantasy readers. I enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. I'm glad that I picked it up. Even though it took a long time to get to it and get it off of my TBR and move it over to my red. Um, I'm very happy that I did. So yeah, give the Priory of the Orange Tree a try. Um, that is it for this video. But I will be back with more book recommendations. Until next time.